Quentin Cauldron, K7DRQ, is a scientist fascinated with all things antennas and propagation. Antennas are where electrical currents meet the atmosphere and how their shape and design affects the way they work. When not simulating antennas, he operates CW on HF and runs weekly H VHF social nets. Outside the shack, Quentin is a data scientist with an agricultural tech company where he uses satellite imagery to predict field health, yield, and progress in carbon capture. He loves good food, being outdoors, and a book in the sunshine. Quentin was born in the south of France and has traveled much of his life. As hams, we view antennas with uh, as incredibly interesting. And so I imagine you, like me, are really looking forward to Quentin Cauldron's presentation, The Antenna Farm, Growing Yagi's Element by Element. And thank you so much, Anne. Welcome, Quentin. Thank you, Catherine. All right, I will uh, share my screen. And um, I would love to talk to you a little bit about uh, designing and modeling antennas, especially about aspects of getting creative with, uh, with the process and um, trying to introduce a few new fun techniques to, to see what we can do in terms of antenna design. Um, and then I'll show you a fun little experiment where I was uh, growing antennas, uh, growing Yagi's one element at a time, and I'll show you some of the funky results we had there. So this talk's going to be uh, in a few uh, sections. One is going to be about antenna design. We'll talk about the fundamentals there, exploring antenna design choices, and uh, we'll have a very brief look at what's available. I'm going to break all of the rules of live presentations and try a live demo, and uh, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, in the second section, we're gonna very briefly look at mathematical optimization, this field uh, of maths that's focused on finding good solutions or good designs to problems that are often not easy to solve. And uh, we talk about kind of searching for solutions that, that work well. So we'll, we'll look into a few approaches there, and then we're going to apply some of those techniques to antenna design. All right, uh, first, uh, quick bit about me. Uh, Alan's already covered most of it, but uh, uh, I enjoy CW primarily, and uh, I act as the secretary for the Puget Sound Repeater Group and an instructor for the Long Island CW Club. I love antennas. On the, uh, the right here, you can see me putting up a, uh, a dipole somewhere at a cabin in Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, outside the shack, uh, I work as a, as a scientist in tech, and uh, I have a background in computer science and physics. What I'm not is an emergency comms expert, and so I'd love your help and, and feedback. Uh, I'll do my best to connect pieces together here, but uh, <laughs> we will uh, we'll meet in the middle, I'm sure. All right, so we're gonna begin by making a, a claim, hopefully not too bold. There is no solvable equation for the parameters of an optimal real antenna. And what this means is that there's, there's no equation that can take into account all of the variables you want, uh, all of the things you want to optimize for your antenna, taking into account all of the environmental conditions. And the equation will not spit out, you know, the Yagi needs to be this size and this dimension and the spacing between the elements to be this and this. Um, there are a few words in this claim that are doing a bit of heavy lifting. And so I'll talk through those real quick. Optimal, the parameters of an optimal real antenna. Well, Optimal for me might mean maybe SWR needs to be optimized, maybe gain, maybe a, if you're looking at a directional antenna, a front to back ratio, or some specific radiation pattern you have in mind. Um, the word real here for me talks about under the constraints of the real world, your antenna exists in relation to the house it's, on, it's over or the ground under you next to the, uh, next to the water any kind of real environment is going to affect how that antenna performs. And then the word solvable, insolvable equation, we'll see that we can experiment, we can use rules of thumb, uh, and we can try different designs and see what sticks. And so follow me along in this claim. Uh, we're gonna start as all kind of uh, antenna modeling does with the isotropic antenna, which is a purely theoretical antenna. We can't build this, but if we could, it would be an antenna that radiates equally in all directions, much like this bell is doing here. And um, 
all we can do to, to improve our antennas is go from this and talk about, well, I'm kind of squeezing the gain in a certain direction. You can imagine this as a balloon and um, we're not able to get free gain. Assuming your antenna is radiating 100% efficiently uh, and is not being lost as heat, for example, then all you have to do, all you're able to do is, is squeeze this, this sphere of gain of radiation in the direction you want. And that's why we often talk about um, uh, directional antennas. And uh, that's where the gain gets significant in one direction at the expense of gain in other directions. So the simplest antenna we can build is the half wave dipole. And here you're seeing a model that's been built, uh, looks like it's been built from coax. You can see the center conductor going off into the left leg and the shield going off into the right. So can we write an equation for the perfect dipole? Well, the first thing to think about is there's a half wave in the name. So maybe we can start with a simple equation. I promise there will only be one in this talk. <laughs> what is the wavelength of a, uh, of a dipole for a given frequency? Well. C is the speed of light, and that's a, a constant that uh, looks something like this. F is our frequency, and we can kind of clean this up a little bit and say, well, I'm interested in frequency in megahertz, and we can round up C to 300. And those cancel out a little bit, and it gives you this wavelength of 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz for a wavelength in meters. If we want to talk about a wavelength in feet, and we want to look at the half wavelength, then what we get is 492 divided by the frequency. So in theory, this is our equation for the perfect dipole. That's how long it should be. And so presumably we're done here, but the internet says 468 divided by the frequency. And so that's because most of the people on the internet are taking into account a factor of around 0 0.95 that uh, has to do with capacitance at the end of the wire um, and so what you're seeing here is that a dipole will resonate when it's actually slightly less than half of its wavelength because of this capacitive end effect. But that's okay, we can factor that in. We now have an equation for the perfect dipole. It's 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz. Trouble is, some of that uh, reality is gonna come and bite us again. Optimal, if you remember from our quote, uh, from our claim, you can only expect an SWR of about 1.4, 1.5, at best in a dipole. And actually then you have to contend with, well, the real world has ground and environmental effects. So we're going to look at these one at a time. The first I'm gonna pull up is this, uh, this picture of a donut shaped radiation pattern from a dipole. The dipole is going vertically through the middle here. And uh, you can see there's no ground. This is that perfect theoretical dipole in free space. That's all well and good, but when you add ground to the equation, you get this really weird squished pattern. Now this donut doesn't look quite so good. And you're starting to get some radiation. It's a little closer to the ground. Uh, you're getting a big lobe that's coming off at maybe 30, 45 degrees. And things are starting to look remarkably different actually. So the ground has a very important effect. And then the environment your dipole is in is also relative to itself. So here we're looking at a vertical dipole. If we were looking at a horizontal dipole, then you get this uh, very different pattern. Looks a little bit like a rubber ducky. You get a lobe going off towards the sky here due to bouncing off the ground. And then you get lobes going off to the sides at relatively low um, elevation. So what we see is that ground and orientation here have a pretty real effect. And because a real antenna exists within the environment, then our goals, SWR, gain, radiation pattern, whatever we want for this antenna is going to be impacted by that environment. So I ran a few calculations here and we'll take a quick look. What we see is uh, two graphs here. On the left, you see the SWR ratio of a dipole, of a uh, horizontal dipole as a function of its height above the ground. And so there's this strange oscillation oscillation going on, this oscillatory component that uh, says your SWR is going to vary depending on how high you are above the ground. Your gain is also going to vary depending on how high you are above the ground. And it's not quite as neat a function, but uh, we can see some interesting uh, gain shifts here, especially if you're exactly two wavelengths above the ground at the four meter mark and at the eight meter mark where you're uh, four wavelengths off the ground, you get a dip in gain. And so these are things to consider 
uh, when you're thinking about designing a perfect antenna. We can look at the same graphs for a vertical dipole. And the left graph looks a little similar. The uh, SWR varies a lot less for vertical dipole. And that kind of makes sense. The radiation is, uh, you're not seeing very much coupling between the dipole itself uh, in terms of area and the ground because it, all it's presenting to the ground is a very thin uh, edge slice. But the gain definitely varies. And so these are some interesting things to keep in mind. So knowing these things, that's the dipole. And we now have a good idea of how long the dipole needs to be and maybe where above the ground we want to position it and in what orientation we want to position it for a given uh, purpose, for a given uh, radiation pattern. But we do have these constraints to, to think about. And sometimes we can't have the antenna at the perfect height uh, or in the perfect environment. So that's that. Let's look at a more complicated antenna now. We're going to look at the Yagi. Uh, the Yagi Uda is a, uh, it's a dipole. You can see that as the second element here. And then there are additional elements. There's always a reflector, typically one, and uh, it's uh, longer than the dipole. And then there are zero to as many as you like directors, which tend to be shorter than the dipole. And they're on the front side of the Yagi. So, Compared to a dipole, this is a lot more complicated. With the dipole, we had to optimize the length of the, uh, of the element and where it was in respect to the ground, if it was horizontal or vertical, and how high. But with the Yagi, we have to optimize also the length of the other elements and the spacing between them. And this is uh, where it gets pretty complicated. So at this point, I turned to the internet and I said, how do I build a Yagi? And the internet said this. So, uh, many different pages tell you different things. They all offer calculators, which is very friendly. And often you type in your frequency. So over here, I'm typing in a frequency of 14652. And it tells me, well, your boom length is going to be this. Your gain is this. You can choose how many elements. Uh, you can choose diameter of the elements. And you can choose the diameter of the boom, whether the boom is isolated from the parasitic elements or not. This other calculator, so well, your dipole length is going to be this, going to be just under half a wavelength. The reflector is going to be a little more, the director is going to be a little less. And the spacing between the elements is going to be one eighth of a wavelength. This one over here said, well, the reflector spacing is going to be actually a fifth of the wavelength. And you're going to be uh, changing other things. This one here says it's also going to be a fifth. Um, this one here says the director will be 5% shorter than the driven element and the reflector will be 5% longer. So we're seeing all of these rules of thumb and for me, it feels very esoteric. I don't know where these design decisions came from and I don't know what they mean. I don't know if they're optimal for my situation. And also interesting is none of these things talk about ground or orientation. And we very clearly saw that it had a huge impact on the resulting pattern you're looking at. Um, I did like this quote here. It is quite possible that other calculators differ, uh, offer slightly different results. Some are based on lookup tables, some completely hide their algorithms. And it goes on to say that some people optimize for this and not that. But uh, if you see a gain larger than 16 uh, decibels, you should be distrustful. And I think that's probably the, the wisest thing on the page. So with that, we're going to think about these rules, where they come from, and look at actually modeling antennas ourselves so that we can see if these are good rules and good design decisions. So in antenna modeling, what you do is you describe your antenna's dimensions and a simulation calculates the electrical currents going through uh, the, the element in which you, uh, you may have a, an excitation and it will calculate the, uh, the resulting electric fields. And what you get out of this is details about your antenna's performance. Here you can see uh, a Yagi that's got uh, a strange radiation pattern, definitely not an optimized Yagi. It's got a big back lobe, which you probably don't want, but uh, it's okay. So the way we do this is um, there's generally one major engine, uh, one piece of software that many people have implemented is accessible at various levels. And it's called the NEC, the Numerical Electromagnetics Code. It uh, sounds a little scary. It solves the electric field integral equation, which I promise I will not go into. Uh, and it accepts something called a card deck. And uh, here I've put on a, a picture of an old fashioned punch card. 
a, uh, a very simple card deck for the NEC engine. And so I'll talk you through very briefly what's on it. Uh, and then I promise we'll never look at them again. So the first line CM stands for a comment. And the comment is a vertical half wave dipole for two meters. CE is comment end. GW is a geometry wire. And I'll talk you through what these numbers mean very quickly. This is the first wire. It's broken up into nine segments. So we model nine pieces independently. The, first, the next three numbers are, uh, are a starting coordinate for an element. X is zero, Y is zero, Z is three. And then the other end of that wire, X is zero, Y is zero, Z is four. So this is a length one meter piece of wire and it has a radius of uh, one millimeter. The next piece is talk a little bit about uh, the geometry end. There's an excitation on segment one, uh, on uh, wire one at segment five, that's right in the middle, and it's a voltage source. And then I'm interested in a frequency of 14652. So fortunately, we don't have to write these things because this would be a little tedious and would get confusing very quickly. We can use some antenna modeling software that offers uh, nice front ends and kind of ways to, to build these things up. So here I'm showing you five very quickly. Um, on the left is four NEC2. That's the one I'll be showing you very briefly today. Uh, the next two are two others also for Windows that are uh, also relatively friendly. Uh, top right, Coco NEC is for the Mac and XNEC 2C uh, works well on Linux. And so you can choose your, uh, choose your OS there. These things are, uh, they're pretty good. So I'll show you the first one uh, for an EC2. So I'm going to pull up my interface here and uh, actually I will stop sharing and reshare. There we go. So what you're looking at here is my, uh, just my setup for uh, modeling in uh, for an EC2. You don't have to be able to read the numbers. I mostly want you to look at this, this nice 3D geometry here and we'll look at the radiation pattern real quick. I'm going to open that first file and I'm just gonna show you that it looks the same as, uh, as what I showed you on the page there. So there's that comment, there's that first wire, and there's the excitation and the, uh, the frequency of 14652. So if I open that, here is that dipole, one meter long, uh, three meters above the ground here, four meters above the ground here. And what I can do is I can just go straight into calculate some output data, and I'm going to calculate a far field pattern. And I can show you that pattern here. And so there you see that donut I showed you at first. So that works pretty well. We can look at it here uh, sideways. So this is uh, a view that looks, uh, here's the top view. And then uh, the view of the side lobes there in the vertical plane. If I were to add a ground to this, then here you can see the ground and the dipole. And if I were to calculate the NEC far field pattern again, then you're gonna get something very different. And you can see those weird lobes coming out as the radiation pattern is squished and reflected against the ground. Sorry so, to interrupt, Quentin. Um, just your, your video is blocking some of the software window. I'm wondering if you might wanna mute your video just for a bit, thank you. Yeah, you don't need to see me. Thank you, Catherine. All right. Uh, so there's that nice squished radiation pattern and you can see it's side on here. What's nice is you can interrogate uh, and look at the gain here. I don't know if you can see that little pink line, I can see the gain at this uh, far edge here. It's 4.2, 4.4 decibels uh, compared to the, uh, the uh, first dipole, uh, which was coming in at 2.13, which is about the, uh, what we would expect for uh, a dipole in free space. And people do some really interesting modeling with this. Um, they can build complete uh, tower Yagis with everything you need. And then you can model the, uh, the radiation pattern of that. And so I can show you that one too. So this is for 40 meters. And you saw that the calculation took just a little longer because there's quite a lot going on here, but there's that radiation pattern and you can, you can look at it from all directions and get a good feel for what it's doing. 
I think this is a very powerful tool for, for modeling and validating your antennas. Now, with that said, uh, we are in a bit of trouble because we do have to tell our, our modeling software what decisions to make for how long these elements are. And to be fair to the software, if I go back to that uh, second dipole, I set it up so that the length of the element was uh, variable. And I started this length equals one here. And again, you don't have to be able to read this. I just want to show you real quick that if I hit start, it's trying a whole bunch of element lengths. And then it's going to settle on one that is hopefully better than when I started. When I started, my gain was, my SWR was 1.72. And it's brought that down to 1.43, which is better and close to as good as you'll get at this height. And so you'll see that the, uh, the length here has shrunk down to 97, 98 centimeters instead of a meter. So that's kind of how you can start to address some of these design questions. How long do I make my elements, et cetera? But uh, for me as a, as, a, as a scientist, I wanted to do something a little more than that. And so I wanted to throw at it some optimization. So the idea here is how do you pick the values of the four element beam I'm showing on screen here um, between the lengths of the four elements and the three spaces between it, the height above the ground, how do I optimize that to make the Yagi that I want? I'm gonna talk through two techniques very briefly. The first one is called simulated annealing. And this is a technique that comes from um, metallurgy originally. And the idea is that if you heat some metal and allow it to cool, as it cools, it will settle into a configuration on the atomic level, on the molecular level, that is better for some definition of better. And that goes back to what we were saying about how do you define optimal? Well, the idea here is, uh, is that you're allowing something to change and then you're going to be a little more picky about what you're allowing it to change to as this theoretical temperature decreases. So um, we're going to take a Yagi and we're going to shake it around. Imagine you're shaking a box of Lego or a box of nails and uh, allowing it to, to settle into a position that's a little better. So I'm actually gonna show you a video of exactly that. This is somebody shaking a box of nails and it's a, a random mess right now. And then you can see some orders start to come out and very soon all of these nails are going to be nicely aligned and no time was spent on, on any individual nail, fortunately. So that is kind of the idea behind annealing. And we're going to do this to a Yagi. Here's a Yagi I'm annealing. And so you can see what's happening to it is the length of the elements is shifting, the space of the elements is shifting, and we're going to just allow it to shake and shake and shake. So the way I do it in practice is I create a hundred or so random Yagis with random element spacing and random length. And then for each, uh, each iteration of my annealing, I create a very, ran a very slightly different Yagi to this one. And then I say, is it better than it was before? And at the beginning of my simulation, I say, it's a little worse. Okay, that's fine, we'll accept it. But then as we go on and on through the iterations, we actually become more picky and we say, well, if the result is better, I'll always accept it. But if the result is worse, I'm going to accept it less and less frequently up until I get to a point where it essentially stops changing and I've found a good Yagi. So the way this works, uh, here is a couple of graphs of my annealing cycle for that two meter dipole. What you're seeing on the left chart here is the length of the element in meters. And I started it much too small. I started it at 85 centimeters. And on the right side, you see the SWR. The uh, x-axis here is the annealing cycle. So think about this as time in my simulation. And what I'm doing is I'm shaking this Yagi. And each time it shakes, it's allowed to change a little bit. Uh, this dipole here, I'm sorry. It's allowed to change a little bit in its length and then it's allowed to settle back down again. And over time, you see that it gets to this plateau. It very quickly improves. Uh, the, the SWR comes way down from eight or nine down to about 1.5. And it does that as the length of the element increases. 
and then it kind of comes to a plateau and over here it's pretty happy. It's no longer going to change very much. So that's the first algorithm I'm going to throw at, uh, at this experiment. Uh, it's essentially a random shaking and allowing it to settle in a happier position. The second algorithm I'm gonna throw at things, uh, I think we all have a bit of intuition for. Uh, it's called the genetic algorithm. And I wanted to read to you this quote uh, by NASA, and I'll, I'll show you the paper in a second. Whereas the current practice of designing antennas by hand is severely limited because it's, it is both time and labor intensive and requires a significant amount of domain knowledge, evolutionary algorithms can be used to search the design space automatically uh, and automatically find novel antenna designs that are more effective than would otherwise be developed. So this is a, uh, a real sales pitch here. Um, this idea of automatically finding antenna designs that are more effective. And this, this word novel, it tells me that there are some configurations of antennas that we may not have thought about that are actually out there and we could maybe access and would do well. So I'll tell you how this works. We're going to start at the top left quadrant. We're going to have a number of Yagis here. I've got 10 of them. And we're going to evaluate each one. And we're going to say, well, the ones in the hotter colors are doing better than the ones in the cool colors. The next stage is to select you know, survival of the fittest. We're going to select the ones that worked well. And we're going to remove from our population the ones that didn't work well. And so you can see we've kept most of the good ones and we've thrown away most of the bad ones. In the bottom right, we do what's called a crossover. We take two Yagis that survived that selection process and we mate them in a way. And the mating of Yagis is, a, is an interesting uh, thought exercise, but essentially what it involves is, well, I work pretty well and you work pretty well. I'm gonna take uh, maybe your middle element length and my spacing and we'll marry those into a new Yagi. And then finally, in the bottom left quadrant, we're going to introduce a slight random change to that, just a random shove, a random shake, just to keep things varied and interesting. And so this kind of simulates the way uh, um, that genetics works today. And uh, the idea is taken just from, from nature there. If we're able to, if species are able to evolve for a certain process or, or niche or environment, then our Yagi should be able to do that too. I'm gonna to show you a picture from that uh, NASA paper I cited just a minute ago. These are two antennas for the ST5 microsats that uh, went up in space. Uh, they're X-bands, so these are, these are in the microwaves, they're in about the eight gigahertz range. And you can see the very, very interesting antennas that uh, came out of this algorithm. You can see that there's no way humans would have been able to think this one through and come up with these designs. But uh, if you're interested in reading this paper, it's pretty interesting. Automated antenna design with evolutionary algorithms. And they have a picture showing progress. And so they started with this random antenna on the left, looks like a bent paper clip. And then through this process of evolution, it bent in a way that somehow was better. And uh, the final antenna then made the cut. You can see it on the right there. Uh, this one went up on one of their microsatellites. They have, um, if you're interested, right-hand circular polarization and uh, they're pretty wide band. They transmit at uh, 8,470 megahertz uh, with an SWR of less than 1.2. And they receive way down at 7.2 gigahertz um, with an SWR of less than 1.5. So they are doing pretty well. All right, so the final thing I'm going to, to throw into my tool bag here is this idea of growing an antenna one by one. This is not so much a, a mathematical optimization technique as it is um, a pretty standard mathematical practice of tackling an easier problem first and then complicating it later. So what I start with is, uh, is a, a dipole and then I add an element and I throw some annealing or some evolution at it. And I let it settle into a good uh, early, short, small Yagi. And then I throw another element at it. And I let that settle and I throw another element at it. And so we're gonna see a few antennas that uh, come out of this and we'll see kind of what happens as this, uh, as this occurs. 
So I needed to take it back to MCOM somehow. And uh, <laughs> here's my first attempt. Um, what sounds good when I'm in the middle of a disaster situation uh, might be local communications. And so I wanted to build an NVIS antenna uh, for 40 meters in this case. And uh, it had to be easy to set up in a hard situation. So I only have one single support and that's gonna be in the middle. And the feet are gonna be on the ground because I wanna you know, peg them into the soil or, or something like that. It has to be uh, an effective antenna. So it has to radiate NVIS. It has to have a low SWR. And uh, um, the height of the center support has to be such that uh, I could buy a telescopic fishing pole or a telescopic mast somewhere and have it ready to go and easy to use in my go bag. And so I put in those constraints and I evolved this, uh, this what I call the MCOM inverted V for 40 meters. Um, it's got an SYR of 1.04 to 1. The ends of the antenna are on the ground and the center is, uh, it came out at about 25 feet for, uh, for which there are several uh, very cheap masts you can find online. And the radiation pattern is, is what I wanted. Now, this is not a particularly complicated or difficult antenna, but it was to show you that uh, you can use these methods. So I started this by uh, starting a number of random inverted Vs, and then I just performed a kneeling on them. And uh, all that does is it says, okay, what if I change the height a little bit? What if I change the angle a little bit? What if I change uh, uh, the radius a little bit, the length of the element a little bit? And we eventually came to this, what I hope is a pretty satisfactory antenna for local comms. The second one I came out with, I put MCOM in quotes here because I wanted to show you that you could uh, grow some pretty funky antennas. This is a 12 element Yagi for 70 centimeters. Uh, the element, the, uh, the SWR is 1.02 to 1. And the reason I say it's funky is because if you imagine a 70 centimeter antenna uh, that uh, I set the height as 1.5 meters. So that's kind of holding it up at shoulder height, right? I'm pointing it in the direction I want to communicate. And you can tell maybe that from the ground here, it doesn't quite look like it's a 70 centimeter um, half wave. And that's because there are three half wavelength elements. And so you can occasionally look at things at three half wavelengths and, and find a harmonic that resonates well. And here we were able to find one. There's a, a very low uh, radiation uh, lobe coming in here, which is wonderful for, for this purpose. I want to just go straight, essentially point to point communications. Uh, and there's a wide beam width, and I'll show you that in our simulation in just a second. The reason that I put MCOM in quotes, I'm sure you'll understand, is um, I don't want to pull out a 12 element beam in an emergency situation, but let's take a quick look at it. All right, so it looks like this. And I'm going to calculate the far field pattern. I'm going to calculate it down to one degree. So it's going to take just an extra second to calculate because I want to see the, the full kind of uh, uh, pattern going on here. And there it is. And I'm going to show you it from the top. There's this very wide beam width. And from the side, it's very, very skinny lobe. So I think this fulfills some of the goals of an MCOM antenna. It is highly inconvenient, I will admit that. Um, and I thought it was a fun little, uh, little result there. All right, um, let's go back to some of the other maddening things we came out with. This one I call the butterfly Yagi just because of the, uh, uh, the radiation pattern here is pretty interesting. This one is built up of half wave elements, which are standard for Yagis and three half wave elements. And just to show you again, the, the kind of innovation or novel antennas you can pull out of these techniques. It's got 10.6 dB of gain at this low elevation forward kind of lobe and uh, 10 in the NVIS kind of configuration. Uh, one of these elements, this one here is actually a five fourths wave element. And so you're starting to see some really interesting mixing as these algorithms discover things that hopefully you may not have thought of.
All right, let's take a quick look at it here. There's the, uh, the butterfly and then the radiation pattern on top of it. Another not particularly useful antenna, but one that shows you the, uh, the creativity of these algorithms. And then the final antenna I wanted to show you, um, because we were on a roll of creating antennas that were not particularly useful, uh, but pretty creative, is what I call uh, a fractal antenna. This one uh, was one that was designed uh, a while back. I gave a talk on this a couple of years ago. I started with a, uh, a loop for 10 meters, just a square loop, and I folded it in on itself until I got to something that was uh, taking up only 40% of the area of the loop. So from here to here, uh, it's taking up 40% of what that 10 meter loop originally took. Um, but the SWR is close to perfect. And uh, we lost a tiny bit of gain, but we're still looking at a 7.6 dB gain loop for a small space. So less convenient because it's a little finicky to set up, um, but you can build some really interesting patterns with this. And in fact, a lot of fractal antenna design goes into the antennas in your mobile phones. All right, the final one is called the big beam. Have you ever wondered what a 50 element beam for two meters might look like? Well, <laughs> now you know, the SWR is 1.01 to one. The gain is 16.8 dB at low elevation. And if you remember that quote from the first uh, Yagi design page, it said, be distrustful of anything over 16 dBD. Uh, and that would be uh, about 18, 19 dBi. And so we're just under that threshold. We're safe. We are uh, inscrutable. Um, this 50 element beam has a 222 meter boom, which is highly unlikely to be uh, useful for anything. But if you want to see it over my house, here it is. I hope the neighbors don't mind. Uh, there's my central pivot there. And uh, it covers several blocks if I were to point it in any one particular direction. And so it's, uh, it's a fun little antenna to think about and uh, not particularly useful. This one was built using that growth annealing and evolution method where I started with the two element Yagi and I used annealing and evolution to settle it down into a good configuration before I added an element. And I did that multiple times. Um, this one took, oh boy, uh, about 20 hours to simulate. And there are some inefficiencies there, uh, but that is uh, the kind of time scale you're looking at to build a 50 meter beam, a uh, 50 element beam for 20 meters. All right, so plenty of time for questions. With that, I wanted to end on a quick takeaway. There are a few obvious rules to antenna design. There are some of these common antennas like the dipole and the Yagi, and we have rules of thumb for building those well. That said, modeling is a very powerful tool and it's rarely once and done. You have to keep coming back to it, tweaking things, improving and, uh, and checking things out. And the good news there is there's scope to be very creative in trying new things and in being curious uh, in experimenting with how you build these antennas. And so uh, with that, well, I would love to take a few questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Quentin. That was fascinating. All right, we have a lot of questions, actually, and I anticipate a lot coming in now. Um, so let's let's get into it. Um, Alan, you had a question about the software. Yes. Would you recommend the 4NEC2 for the antenna modeling for uh, for a beginner? I think so. There, there are quite a few tutorials out there and it's relatively easy to use. Um, there's no one piece of modeling software that's exceptionally easy to use, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's a good place to start, I think. Great. Okay, actually, segueing from that question, um, is the software able, I mean, I, you have it showing ground, but is the software also able to account for other features like buildings or other materials that may influence propagation? Yes and no. Um, you saw in one of the examples, someone had built up a tower out of wires. And so the NEC engine that is behind the vast majority of these tools can do surfaces or wires. And so if you 
construct a metal sheet and pretend it's a building, um, then you can kind of play with that a little bit. It's not going to be great for things like concrete complex buildings. Um, and that's a great uh, point to mention that no simulation is ever realistically perfect. I have a Fair question enough. in regards to, uh, you showed the inverted V uh, antenna uh, and it's interesting uh, uh, pattern, the effects of ground. What about looking at that particular antenna top down? Uh, the uh, What would be the azimuth pattern? Would it be similar to a dipole? I think it would be very similar to an Omni when it's that low to the ground, but we can take a look at it together if you like. Oh, yeah. So there is that inverted V, and let's just calculate a pattern for it. And if I show the pattern, then top down, it's, it's essentially an Omni at this point. Yes. Uh, generally, you start to lose a lot of the bidirectionality you get as you get very close to the ground. And this being a 40 meter wavelength antenna, uh, at 25 feet, it is very close to the ground. Great. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question that I think comes up quite frequently about um, operators who have restrictions on what they can do if they have a HOA or something like that. And I was thinking about your fractal antenna looking a lot like a tree. Like, what are your suggestions for disguising your antennas? I, I started looking at the fractal antennas because I was living in an apartment and I didn't have very much space. So the, the space saving component was very good. Space saving does come with stealth. And so that is uh, very useful. Um, in terms of practical purpose, it's probably going to be hard to be throwing a wire into a tree. And, and uh, uh, I see that done a great deal. Um, the downsides of the fractal antenna is it has to be self-supporting. It has to maintain that shape. And so you've got to be, uh, you're a lot less flexible in terms of um, hiding it in branches or, or that kind of thing. That being said, if you can place it on your roof, then that could work quite well as a loop. Fantastic, thank you. In oh, regards ahead. to uh, simplifying uh, the Yagi design, say maybe three elements. Uh, question for Mark, do you find that a basic Yagi with one director and one reflector with a middle dipole, whether it's sufficient versus those complicated Yagis with multiple elements? Yeah, absolutely. Um, on that 50 element madness monster, um, I start to see diminishing returns very quickly around the, the 10 to 15 element uh, number. And so a three element beam certainly has room for improvement in terms of more elements. But if you optimize where it is in terms of the ground, you can get 15 dB gain out of a three element um, without too much trouble. And so you're not going to get very much more than that in general. Uh, well, thank you. Um, we have a question. Uh, actually, we had a, a, a late person joining us. And just can you confirm for him that the software you were showing us just now was the 4NEC2 software? Yeah, great. Um, so another question from another member here today is, uh, is your annealing process automatic or do you make a single change and then record the changes manually? Thank you. That's a really great segue. Um, I actually built a Python package to do all this myself. So uh, it's it's automatic. Uh, I'm going to open source it hopefully quite soon. But uh, essentially, it's a it's a Python package that talks to NEC directly using some some C++ bindings. And so the Python will take the geometry of the antenna. It will do some annealing. It will talk to NEC and say, how's this? It will get the results back. And then from there, it decides uh, where to go in the, in the annealing process. Okay. That, that's that great. That's a helpful answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, Alan, did you have another question for Quentin? Uh, not really. The, what, there was one question, but I think it was answered. That was the uh, in, initially in the, your presentation. Um, your uh, question was whether you were also using for NEC2 or were you using any other uh, models? Yeah, I, I only use for NEC2 to, to, to visualize things graphically. Um, the uh, so for NEC2, uh, Easy NEC, and everything else, most everything else, is um, is essentially a front end to the NEC engine. 
And so it gives users this, this nice GUI where you can click around and view things and make changes. And it calls the NEC engine for you by writing those card files, essentially. Um, now, um, because my Python code generates that and talks to NEC for us, it essentially acts as another front end. It's not very pretty, so I won't show it to you. Um, but um, it does all of these kind of more complicated uh, methods for uh, evolving antennas. Well, I think the results were quite interesting, especially those showing the, uh, the effects of the ground mm -hmm. on these uh, various antennas and uh, something that we all as hams tend to leave out. And uh, also the tie-in with biology, uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, this growth annealing and uh, uh, evolution concept uh, of your design approach. I think that's uh, quite uh, fascinating. Thank you. The, the whole field of mathematical, mathematical optimization, it's, it's full of these inspirations from biology. There are, um, there's a great algorithm called the ant colony optimization. Uh, there's a bee swarming algorithm and all sorts of things that take inspiration from biology and, and turn them into methods for finding more uh, optimal solutions to complicated problems. Mm -hmm. It seems like a natural fit. Yeah, my, my background is in biology and I thought the, um, the use of genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms is fascinating. And those mini sat antennas were wild. Their final designs is really fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question asking if you have a website where you're talking about your experiments uh, mathematically. Um, you mentioned you're hoping to make your software available. Uh, where would someone go to, to follow your progress? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, my website's currently down. <laughs> but um, if you email me, um, I can share in the chat in a second my, my email, or you can find me on QRZ. Um, very happy to share what I've got so far. and. Uh, and uh, open that software up very soon. That's fantastic. Uh, well, thank you, Quentin. Um, it, this is the last chance for people to ask Quentin any questions. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to have a, a, a break for people to grab a sandwich uh, to come back for our next speaker. Any last questions for our speaker? There? And hey, have, have you, of Quentin, ever used a flagpole in any of your designs? I have not. Um, yeah, that would be fun though. What do you have in mind? Well, we probably need to uh, isolate the loading from ground, but <laughs> saw it, add, an, uh, add some insulation and uh, piece it back together. And this is kind of where the, uh, the using the GUI for the NEC is, is hard, right? All right? I've got to put on a big flagpole, that's fine, but then I've got to create 16 radials and all of this other kind of thing. It, it can be a little slow to do. So this automatic search is, is pretty fun for that. Uh, Quentin, I'm gonna pop in with a quick question for you. Um, so in that NASA antenna that was, that where you first illustrated the evolutionary concept, um, it started with this really random shape and then you could sort of tell, I mean, it seems like that the, the evolved finished product, you could sort of tell that that was the starting point. So. So using the evolutionary concept, you still, you have to have some starting point, which presumably a human kind of uh, comes up with. Is there, is there discussion about how you actually evolve the starting point itself or derive that um, so that we're not just influencing it with either by being so random that we might not be picking a good starting point <laughs> or by picking starting points that have a confirmation bias from what we already think. Yeah. So the, the, you're touching on something important here, which is that a lot of these evolutionary algorithms are a numbers game. And so the uh, the way that particular antenna was evolved is you you define an antenna as there's a piece of wire that is some length and some angle from the ground. And then there's a piece of wire on that that is some length and some angle. And then there's a piece of wire that is some length and some angle. And so each of these elements, you have two dimensions to play with. And you you say, all right, I'm going to start with four pieces of wire i can bend my paper clip four times and you create a hundred a thousand random versions of this and that's your starting point so your starting point has some structure in, in my case the starting point was a two element yagi or a five element yagi and i would create 200 random ones with most of them would be absolutely terrible 
right? But you find a few that are good and you mate them together and then you get something better. And as you do this repeatedly, you, you hone in on something that can be very, very good. Uh, one question I had was um, you, the diagram that you showed showed mutation. How, how is that introduced in software? Yeah, so when you when you mate Yagi's, you, you take, so a Yagi a, with four elements has seven dimensions for me. It has four element lengths and three element spacings. And so you, you have seven numbers. And when you mate them, you combine those two sets of seven numbers in, in some way as defined by your algorithm. That's the mating, the, the, that's the crossover. The um, mutation is after I've crossed over, I have seven uh, numbers and I'm just going to shuffle them a little bit. I'm just going to change them. I'm going to add a little bit of random noise generally. Okay. And that's the uh, mutation. I think the challenge and the, the fun is in the design and the building of what you create. But do you ever occasionally go out and buy an antenna? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I have a homebrew evolved j pole. It's a collinear um, for 70 centimeters. And so that one was designed and, and homebrewed. But uh, my two meter uh, beam is, a, is an arrow antenna. Uh, it's that three element, seven element cross Yagi. Um, and I enjoy using that one a lot. And uh, cross Yagi, uh, any uh, brings up uh, satellite work to you. Uh, have you done any uh, antenna design for uh, for satellites? I've tried and failed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I think I need a better. I was using a Baofeng at the time, and I think I need something with a little more sensitivity. So uh, I'll try again. And I'm also questioning my um, oh the the duplexer. So <laughs> I will try again. Well, fantastic. Well, we wish you luck with that and um, with your, you know, subsequent designs for your other antennas. It's been really fascinating. I think people have to ruminate on this a little bit and absorb and, and percolate. And I'm sure there'll be many other questions. So exciting uh, to see it when your website is back up and, and um, we can get back to you with those questions. And um, thank you so much for being here. That was so interesting. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Alan.